Research Foundations um, and do genetic based data analysis on the deposit into public database. There are already you know, several thousands of tumor genetic data that has been deposited. And we extracted data for CHCR4 in these cancers and then looked at what happens to CHCR4 expression in the tumors, in human tumors. And what we have observed is that other than the you know, liquid tumors, among the solid tumors, other than kidney tumors, small cell lung cancer has the highest level of CHCR4 expression. This actually validated the data that we have seen in cell lines and helped us to really move forward. And then when we look at different kinds of lung cancers, we have also seen that small cell lung cancers have the highest level of the protein that we are looking for compared to other subtypes of lung cancers. So we thought, okay, fantastic, we have a cancer that you know, extremely expresses high levels of the protein that we are looking for, and we have a clinically available agents that we can really use to optimize therapy. Hopefully we will make an impact. So before we did that, we also wanted to look at if there is some kind of abnormality with the kind of data that we are doing. Because in all the immune cells express various kinds of cells. And as you know, smoking causes a lot of inflammation. And we are looking at the tumors. So we wanted to see, oh, is it only CHCR4 that is more expressed in these tumors? Or is it like an inflammatory response that we are seeing in the tumors? Therefore, there are a lot of other chemokines and chemokine receptors that are also more expressed. So to do that, we extracted all kinds of chemokines and chemokine receptor data and looked at what happens to all of them in small cell lung cancers. And what we have observed is that about small cell lung cancers uniformly express CHCR4, but not much of the other chemokine receptors. So then it suggested us that oh, small cell lung cancers actually have specifically more expression of this particular protein. To further validate that, we went into doing basically ILC, Elstone in Better Islam, and how important it is for us to be able to have good tumor samples for all of us to be able to characterize any for any new development. And then we looked at the CHCR4 expression in these tumors, and so that about like 50% of the tumors, about 50% of the tumors actually have membrane expression of the CHCR4. So that way, at least 50% of the tumors now we can really target as a possibility for you know, improving therapy. So to test this, we took patient-derived xenografts. So there's a new trend um, now that instead of using cell lines to generate tumors in mice, now what we're trying to do is take the patient biopsy, grow them in mice directly, where we don't culture them in cells at all. And once the tumor develops, and then we can really propagate them tumors only in mice. The advantage of this is that what we have found is that the general characterization of the pattern of the tumors when we directly transfer from the patient to the mice represent closely that of the patient genetic tumor characteristics. Whereas cell lines that deviate, you know, we don't actually now know what is the genetic characteristics of the primary tumors. That's how different they are. So this allows us to at least mimic the human tumors a little bit more closely in terms of the genetic makeup. So we have a, a large collection of these PDXs that are Hopkins. We screened those tumor uh, you know, xenografts and then picked three different tumors that have almost no expression of the protein, have low level expression of the protein, and have very high level of expression of the protein that is scored by a pathologist between like 0 to and plus 3 is 4. And we put them on therapy for a CHCR4 inhibitor. The black is the control that they received only like a vehicle, like PBS. And then green is the one that we are putting uh, CHCR4 inhibitor that is more expressed in these tumors. What we have observed, as you can see, that the tumor growth in all the three different tumor models did not really change compared to the control. You can't hear Is that better? Sorry. So what we have observed is that none of the tumors, either low expression one or high expression one, really respond to the tumor. Somewhere here. Uh, so it's surprising because now we are looking at a protein that is overexpressed, but then we can't really change the tumor growth 
it tells us you know, something there is a protein, but the drug that we know for sure acts on this particular protein that is not really doing any uh, perfect, you know, impact on the tumor growth. So this is where we got into um, you know, really using the imaging to understand perfect response. Um, I, I think most of you would have a you know, familiarity with the you know, PET, but I just want to give you a brief uh, you know, introduction in a way that all we do is basically, because we're chemistry focused, we take a molecule, we treat it in a way that we can put a radio label on that. And then once you take the radio label goes into the patient, you we have actually moved in there. I don't know if they can operate that. And then you actually acquire the PET image, and then it allows us to really see where the radioactivity is in the uh, patient or in the mouse. So previously we have developed PET imaging agents for CXCR4 and published them to show that these molecules have a high specificity for CXCR4. Here you see that there's a tumor that has a CXCR4 positive tumor, CXCR4 negative tumor. When we inject the imaging agent, it nicely accumulates a CXCR4 positive tumor. We evaluated this in other like lung tumor models. Here you can see that in the lung tumor, you can really see a very nice red radioactive uptake in the tumor. So with this information now that we know that the imaging agent actually binds to the receptor we are looking for, so we wanted to ask a question, is the drug really doing anything at the tumor? We, are, we know that there is a tumor that has a protein expression. We are injecting a therapeutic that we know that really binds to the protein. Now is it really binding to the protein in vivo? So to do that, what we did is we took one of the tumor models, and then we put them, all these, these mouse models on therapy for seven days with the same therapeutic agent. And then on, on but in different doses from anywhere between 0.3 milligrams per kg to 0. You know, 10 milligrams, 30 milligrams per kg dose. We wanted to see if the dose <coughs> exposure effect. And then on day eight, we came with the hydrogen agent for the same CXCR4 protein. And then we wanted to look at what happens to the CXCR4 imaging agent uptake in the tumor. If the drug was really working and blocking the receptor of the tumor, with the increased dose, we should see a reduced imaging agent uptake in the tumors because we are blocking the CXCR4 receptor. You know, not surprisingly, what we observe is in the control, you see that, as you can see the tumor nicely. As you increase the dose, the tumor uptake drastically decreases by 10 minutes per kg or so. We don't see actually much imaging agent uptake in the tumor. What it told us is that we are actually, the drug, whatever we are injecting, is acting at the tumor. It is also reducing the protein expression in the tumor. By doing all of this, we don't really have any effect. So it tells us that there is something is happening even though we are able to eat the protein that we think that is really good to cause tumor growth arrest. So with that we know that we can't really use this directly by itself. CXR converters, we can't really use them directly as a way to inhibit tumor growth. So we wanted to see can we really combine this with the existing therapies to see if we can really improve those therapies. And to do that, we combined with cisplatin, which is the primary drug for small cell lung cancer. This time we took five tumor models that have different IHC scores. Because we want to have a higher reproducibility, two of the tumors have zero CXCR4 expression. And then we IHC score of plus one, plus two, and plus three. And we put them on cisplatin combined with CXCR4 therapy. What we have observed is that the black one is the control, green is uh, CXCR4 inhibitor. The pink one is cisplatin, and the blue uh, curvy area you're seeing is a combination therapy. When there is no CXCR4 protein in the tumors, cisplatin, adding to cisplatin or the existing chemotherapy really doesn't make any difference in tumor growth. The tumors go as they are. If the tumors have even a little bit of CXCR4 expression in them, when we combine this agent with CXCR4 you know, inhibitors with the existing chemotherapy, they actually cause significant tumor growth targets. The higher the tumor CXCR4 expression, the you know, better is the response of the tumors to the existing chemotherapy. And even when the tumors basically they don't respond very well to cisplatin, if they have really high CXCR4 expression, even though they don't cause regression of the tumors, they at least provide a you know static um, you know, tumor growth, suggesting that we can really combine is you know, imaging agents with existing therapies. 
So we combine this, I will skip that. So one thing we observe during this process is that small cell lung cancer is very hard to get biopsies. That means that we have to rely on imaging more and more to be able to guide these therapies. Now here we are an imaging agent, we have imaging agent, we have therapeutic agent. Now can we really combine them to guide therapy in patients? And we can also really put these agents into the clinic as well. We have a good center, that Center for Translation and Molecular Imaging, that it helps us to really translate imaging agents into the clinic. So to do that, we wanted to really see can we really look at drug induced changes in the tumor, and then if the drug is acting in the tumor, can we really use the imaging, can we visualize that or not? And these are the same tumor models. This is a control, you can see the tumor that's there. When you treat with CHR from the better, you see that the drug is actually reaching the tumor, and the imaging is that they go down. When you combine the, you know, put the tumors on the cisplatin and the duct side, it actually increases the CHR4 expression in the tumors. And when we combine that, those you know, cisplatin and dioxide with the AMA to the CHR4 inhibitor, you see that the drug is actually blocking the chemotherapy induced changes as well. So now this gives a little bit more momentum to see that, okay, okay we actually use imaging agents not only to guide, you know, select patients, but also to guide therapies into um, of those patients. So all those tumors that I have shown are, shown are sub-Q tumors, where we are actually putting the tumors in the flag. Sometimes they don't really represent, you know, lung tumors that would actually be in a really autotopic environment. So to do that, we actually generate the autotopic lung tumors where we implant tumor cells, and then use CT imaging to characterize the tumor growth to see what happens to the tumor. In the same combination, you see that this the pink ones are the lungs, this red is actually tumor growth. If you don't treat the tumors, they by week two or so, the tumors completely spread to the both the lungs. If you were to use the existing chemotherapy, you see that the arrest the tumor growth up to four weeks or so. By six weeks, the tumor spread to the whole lungs. If we were to really combine our inhibitors with the existing chemotherapy, it is able to prevent at least until six or eight weeks or so for the spread to the other lobes of the lungs. And we can really see that reflecting in terms of the survival, where we see about 40 to 50 percent of increase in survival in these mouse models. So this is where our radio information were coming. That we acquired all these huge amounts of CT data. We wanted to see how can we really use this CT data to help us to predict which you know tumors are going to respond or not. So we started working with bioinformatics people and then extracting and creating a you know imaging score for these tumors and then see how they correlate with survival. What we have observed is that when we create this summary of the imaging score of the tumors, we can really differentiate between the responders and non-responders between different groups. Even though it's the same tumor model, because we are using a patient tumor, that's we are creating a animal model. And we have, there are 14 mice in the same group in each group. All of them are getting the same tumor. But only we see you know, about 60% or 70% of them respond very well. The remaining 30% really do not respond. Right? It is a really, very, very well controlled system. Whereas in humans, we don't really have that kind of opportunity. Even in those kind of systems, by using this informatics approach, we are able to really differentiate between which tumors really um, respond better and which tumors do not respond. We hope that in the long run, by combining these kind of things, we'll be able to really tell, even up front, oh, these patients actually may have a better chance of responding to these patients, you know, probably they may need to go to other therapy. That is at least the dream. So I think I'm going to skip some of these things. Now we're actually optimizing some of these therapies with something called antibody drug conjugates. And you may have seen this in uh, for uh, breast cancers with HER2 protein, uh, where we are, you know, taking advantage of the antibodies which have very high specificity to a particular target and then we are come attaching chemotherapies to them. Now we are actually very specifically targeting chemotherapy to the tumor and not to the rest of the body. So now we are actually combining CHCR4 based inhibitors. You know, we are creating these antibody drug conjugates that have much higher uh, sensitivity and specificity. So we combine that, we generate that and then we wanted to see how it will fare uh, with respect to the 
chemotherapy combinations that we have generated. So this is all the data that you have seen before, where we are showing that by combining the you know combination therapies, you improve or reduce tumor growth for much longer periods of time. But with the green one that you are seeing is where we are injecting these mice, we are getting only one single dose of cisplatin and only one single dose of the antibody drug conjugate. Whereas all other groups you are seeing, they are getting cisplatin at least three minimum doses and they get CXCR4 inhibitor for 21 days. Now we have actually skipped all that and we injected one dose of cisplatin and one dose of antibody drug conjugate. And then you can see that the tumors in this group actually grow delays much longer. Not only that, when they come back up and when we actually did the second treatment, the tumor actually, um, you know, growth keeps going down. So this is where we are going to see what we can really do in terms of improving therapies. So now we are also working on um, immune, you know, immunotherapy related therapies, something like, you know, PDL1 program, that ligand one. Program, if you're seeing in Yahoo, sometimes people say that, you know, there's that like patient saying that tumors are getting melted away by immunotherapies. So there's a lot of interest in developing these immunotherapies, in the, in particularly at Hopkins, we are at the forefront of this. There are you know, probably 20, 30 clinical trials at Hopkins alone. But one of the limitations of these immunotherapies is, is that immune-related events. They have a significant toxicity, immune-related toxicity, where patients report basically all their pancreas smells of it after three, four months or so. We are trying to understand why the why these therapies are being like so effective. How are these immune related events are happening? How can we really prevent them? How can we really dose antibodies in a manner that we can really reduce the toxicity associated with it? Not only that, because these antibodies are so expensive, about 70 you know lakhs per patient, 100,000 in US per year. Can we really reduce the dose that we are injecting? And then how can we really do that? So we got into this PDL1 imaging, and then we developed actually imaging agents that will skip that. Now we have uh, this peptide, nice peptide, where we can really look at PDL1 expression in the tumors. And then one thing we have observed is that with the imaging agents we developed, we can really visualize the antibody that is reaching the tumor. Can we really see whether it's really reaching the tumor, how much of it is really being, you know, occupying the tumor PDL1 expression? So with this new imaging 